This morning, it's such a privilege to be with you. My name is Taiki, and I'm a partner at our Hatfield campus, and uh, I get to take us a little bit further in the journey in the Book of Colossians this morning. So I hope we're going to have great fun. My wife and I were here right at the beginning of Parkview campus, for those of you that don't know, and it was so much fun to pioneer uh, this campus with everybody else. I see some of the faces. You guys are amazing. Um, But this morning, as we look at the book of Colossians, today we're really going to be looking at what God has to say about how we approach some of the most significant relationships we have in our lives, the places where we spend the bulk of our time. So we've been through Colossians for a while now. We know that Paul uh, penned this letter during his imprisonment around AD 60 to 62. And what this book really addresses is... Colossians addresses the church at the time who had received a unique blend of philosophical and religious inputs, and and there were a few challenges there, and and Paul wanted to address just some of those influences that had made its way into the church's understanding and the way they understood certain of these lifestyle things. And today's portion of Scripture, just a caveat, uh, has been used, abused, taken out of context, and it has the potential to immediately yank us out of a space where we invite God to come and do work within us. So I'm just going to ask, can we just pray before we launch in? Let's bow our heads. Lord, we just thank you that you are here with us this morning. And I just want to pray, God, against any preconceived ideas or notions we have within us or maybe abuses that have been visited on us using the verses we're going to be looking at today. And I want to pray, God, that we just give you a clean slate to come and write on our hearts and our minds whatever you want to through this scripture this morning. Would you come and do that, Lord? We love you. Come and be with us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So if we can all turn to Colossians 3, and we'll be starting at around verse 17 this morning. And uh, Joe did preach on this exact same scripture last week, so we felt a double whammy was uh, a good thing to just come and do. And uh, you can turn there in your Bibles, you version, or it will be on the screens as well. So Colossians 3, 17 to 4, uh, verse 1, and it says, and whatever you do, In word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands, as is fitting in the Lord. I heard that cough. Um, Husbands, love your wives and don't be bitter towards them. I see those elbows. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Um, Some translations say, do not provoke them to anger so that they won't become discouraged. Slaves, obey your human masters in everything. Don't work only while being watched as people pleases, but work wholeheartedly, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do it from the heart as something done for the Lord and not for people, knowing that you will receive the reward of an inheritance from the Lord. You serve the Lord Christ. Amen. Amen. So let's be honest. Who of you bristled up a little bit as I read that passage? I think there's probably a few of you that find it a little uncomfortable. And I don't blame you because, to be honest, when they gave me this p- passage to preach on, um, I started feeling a cough. And, uh, and I felt like saying, uh, I might not be able to make it. Um, but, but the more I poured over this piece of scripture, the more I thought to myself, yes, yes, Paul, yes. Verse 18 in this piece of scripture, let's just call out the elephant in the room, is one of the most unpopular verses in all of scripture, not because of what it says, but because of how it's been interpreted and because of how society has distorted the message behind it. It's been used to degrade and debase and minimize women, but let me be clear this morning, that is not God's heart when he writes this scripture, and it's not what this passage is about. 
In this passage, Paul addresses six, six significant relationships. A wife to her husband, a husband to his wife, children to parents, fathers and mothers to their children, and finally slaves to their masters and masters to their slaves. And I truly believe there's a reason Paul starts with verse 17, just before verse 18, because he's trying to orientate the reader and the hearer of this word when he says in verse 17, and whatever you do in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And then he says this passage about husbands, wives, children, parents. And then he says it again in verse 23 and 24. Whatever you do, do it from the heart as something done for the Lord and not for people, knowing that you will receive the inheritance from the Lord. You serve the Lord Christ. Now he does this because he's battling different schools of thought that existed at the time. One being that as long as you live a life focused on God and prayer and scripture, then how you treat your spouse, your children, or your slaves doesn't matter all that much because you focused on God, right? Does that sound familiar? Because I can draw that parallel with some of our lives. As long as we do the things, the things, the reading our Bibles, we mutter cursory prayers and we come to church, that's enough isn't it? Externally, we're doing all of the things, but internally, the question comes, has Christ permeated all of who we are? And that's what Paul speaks into this morning. We can know God, we can know His Word, but is it woven into every aspect of our lives? Now, I'm not going to address all of these relationships this morning because we don't have that kind of time, but what I will do is make some cursory comments which need to make, be made and then take us to what I believe Paul was, in fact, most trying to drive home. So let's start with verse 18, and, and there it says, wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. And, and as I was poring over this piece, um, I, I just saw a few things in this passage. The first and some of you might have seen it, some of you might have missed it. It says, submit yourselves. Yeah. It does not say, be forced into submission. Yeah. Let me ask you, who is this verse written to? Who's it written to? Yeah. Wives. It's written to wives. So husbands, I want to say, this verse is not for you. And it was never, ever meant to be a weapon to be held over your wives' heads. Get out of your wife's verse, okay? <laughs> if that were the case, the verse would rather have read, husbands, subdue your wives, but it doesn't say that. The passage in no way teaches the universal submission of women to men in society or in the workplace, and it was written specifically for a marital relationship. The word submit here is the word upotaso, which essentially means to yield to, to yield to, willingly. John Piper puts it this way. He, he writes, a wife's submission to her husband is a joyful, intelligent, fearless disposition under the supreme lordship of Jesus to affirm, receive, and nurture the strength and leadership of her husband. Look at those words. Joyful, not fearful. Intelligent, not ignorant, because that is what the world says. To submit under anyone, is, it shows ignorance. Um, and fearless, not trepidatious, not worried about what will come tomorrow. Perhaps the most important part of this verse for me, and it unlocked so much, is that end bit that says, as is fitting in the Lord. The Bible doesn't color in what this kind of submission really, really looks like, but it gives us the phrase, as is fitting in the Lord. And this one part unlocked the whole passage for me, because this word fitting in the original Greek is the word anikon. And it means to do what is fit or becoming. Combine that within the Lord and take note of the two passages that sandwich this passage. And what this passage says to do is do whatever the Lord would require of you. Essentially what this verse is saying is know Jesus so well that in every moment you are ready to, to respond to your husband as Jesus would need you to. It's that simple. In verse 19, Paul says, husbands, love your wives. And again, husbands, this verse is for you. And this passage in Colossians mirrors other passages in Ephesians 5 and 1 Peter 3. And, uh, and in those passages, 
they write a lot more and they give a lot more detail about how this all works. But in Ephesians 5, Paul takes it and he reduces it down to these few lines. But, but there's something about the Ephesians 5 passage where Paul says it this way. He says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. A husband is called to lead, but also to love. And those two things should never be separated. Paul defines this love by the love that Jesus has for his bride, the church. And in the same way that Jesus gave up his life for the church, you are to give up your life for your wife. And in Jesus, we've got the perfect picture of what this looks like. He was God, but he never lauded that position over anyone. And he always did the most loving thing, including giving up his life for those that he loved. And in John 13, 1 to 17, we see Jesus, just before he goes to the cross, he does something that catches us all off guard. He, he pulls his disciples together and, and he kneels, he takes off his robe, he washes their feet and Jesus modeled for us in that moment what it means to lay aside power and majesty and to serve those that he loves. And as husbands, that is what we are called to do. C.S. Lewis puts it this way. He says, God gives man a crown to wear in marriage, but it is primarily made of paper and thorns. Paper because it is just a role that we fulfill and a crown of thorns because it's a call to sacrifice. It's a call to sacrifice. The design is not wife submit, husband love. It is husband and wife submit to and love Christ, grow in his likeness, and you will naturally begin to do what God requires of you. Wives, you will want to submit to your husband. Why? Because when your husband is running after Jesus, you would follow him anywhere. And and husbands, when your wife is in Jesus and his radiance flows out of her, there is nothing you would not do or move or undertake to serve her. But what about the not yet spaces? Because I know there's some of us, there's a turmoil that comes up as I say these things. Because some of you are like, okay, but our marriage doesn't look like that yet. Because it's easy to submit and love everyone when everyone is doing exactly what they should be doing. And, uh, and the reality of this verse is we aren't told to submit when he loves me. We aren't told to love when she submits. Because let's face it, anybody that's been married knows that there are seasons when our spouse is not going to yield to our leading. And there are times when our spouse is not loving us the way we feel they should be. And the question I have for us is this. What would Christ have us do in those seasons? And I say this sensitively because I grew up in a home where Christ did not feature. I remember night after night running to the neighbors to phone the police because my mom was being beaten in our home. And I remember working in my parents' business because uh, neither of them were able to get up in the morning instead of going to school. And I remember going to church just to get away from the craziness of life. <sighs> And it was the farthest thing that I experienced in my home from God's plan for marriage or parenting. So when I say these things and when I say, I say them sensitively, you need to understand. I, I, I know that some of our home environments that we grew up in or that we're in right now don't look the way I'm describing. And, but I want to say today, I don't believe God expects us to stay in Abuse. I've seen husbands and wives abused by their spouses, and that's not what I'm talking about here. But what I'm talking about here is specifically seasons when, when let's face it, you're up to your eyeballs in diapers, you haven't slept in, your, in weeks, and your spouse isn't loving you the way you feel they should, or, or work has taken the front seat, and you haven't locked eyeballs with each other in weeks, and, and someone starts to feel hurt in the midst of all of this. And, and in those seasons, I've often sought God because I'm human and I get hurt. And, and you know what he's encouraged me to do in those seasons? To keep loving my spouse. There have been seasons when I've struggled with my mental health and I'm a bit checked out. And you know what Maya does in those seasons? My beautiful wife, she seeks the Lord and she keeps yielding to my lead. There are seasons when she's just working ridiculous hours and we're just not getting to everything. And, and you know what? 
in those seasons, I seek the Lord and I love my wife. Does that mean it is all sunshine and roses in our home? Absolutely not. We are flawed. Yes, we have fought. And we have given the neighbors an earful of drama that they listen to, probably with bated breath. And we have even used a couple of colorful words when we've had those arguments. But the one commitment we have repeatedly made is to keep coming back to God and ask, what would you have me do? And how would you have me respond to and love my spouse in this moment? And this is hard. This passage also speaks about the relationship between a parent and a child, that a child should obey their parents, that a parent should not provoke their child, that a master should treat their slave fairly, and a slave should work for their master as if they're working for the Lord. And and these verses address our marriages and our parenting and how we should approach work, both as someone working for a master and and for those of us who lead others in the workplace. And I want to posit this morning... That in each of these instances, we should be drawn back to the same question. What is fitting in the Lord? And what would he have me do? Paul addresses these areas both because they're the areas that will challenge us most in life. But it's also the areas that lend themselves most to dysfunction and brokenness when they are not built on Christ. These are the areas in which the enemy works to see us fail and in which the world looks on into to judge whether the Christian life is all that it claims to be. We live in a society at the moment where women have been told it's weak to let a man take the lead, even if that man loves Christ and his wife. We live in a society where men have shirked their responsibility and have stopped caring about the spiritual direction of their families. We live in a society where children don't respect their parents because they don't live what they say they believe and And where parents don't respect their children because respect is demanded, not earned through love and nurturing. And we live in a society that has made work a swear word and a curse that we live under until we get to enjoy life in our retirement. But can you imagine something with me for a moment that would happen if each of these spaces, each of these relationships was permeated to the utmost with the Lordship and the presence of Jesus Christ? Marriage is thriving as we love and serve one another as is fitting in the Lord. Parents raising their children as is fitting in the Lord. Children seeing Jesus, experiencing his love and loving their parents in turn as is fitting in the Lord. Our workplace is becoming spaces where kingdom reality exists simply because Christ goes with us wherever we go. No matter who our boss is, as is fitting in the Lord. But there's a linchpin. There's, there's something we need to take note of if we hope to see any of that realize. And that is that we need to invite God into those spaces and places in our lives. Not only the comfortable spaces that it's okay to invite him into, but the spaces that are going to require the most amount of surrender and the spaces that he's going to climb into and probably do a few uncomfortable things in. Can you imagine for a moment if you invite God into that space and he asks you to apologize to your spouse when you were not in the wrong? Can you imagine what that would be like? I can because it's happened. My wife and I have had an argument and I'm never wrong. And, um, and yeah, okay, uh, that's not true. Okay, for those of you that are like, wow, this guy. Um, no, uh, it, uh, it lands better where people know me. But my wife and I have had these arguments and, and there have been times where I'm just like, God, can you believe what she just said to me? What do I do now? What is the response, the correct response in this moment? She should apologize to me. And then he goes, you will get in your car and you will drive to the garage and you will get the nicest bunch of flowers you possibly can, you will return home and you will give them to your wife and you will love her. And, um, and in that moment, I'm like, what? What? God, what? She should apologize to me. And there's a little discourse that happens. And then I get in my car and I go buy the flowers and I come home. So what if God asks us to do that, to apologize to our spouse? What if God asks us to start praying for that coworker or boss? Go pray over their desk in the mornings before they get there and start praying blessing into their life. What if God wants you to finally deal with the childhood trauma that you went through so that you can be a better parent and a better husband or wife? 
So how? How do we give God more space in those significant relationships and spaces in our lives? And, and today I'm going to say that it's simply this. Stop, drop, and roll. Stop, drop, and roll. First of all, stop. Stop going with the flow. Take stock. Recently, I've been reading a book called Practicing the Way by John Mark Comer. And, and in it, he speaks about the development of our Christianity and the stages that we go through as we grow in our Christian discipleship. And it's based off a theory put together by Dr. Janet Hagberg and Robert Gulich called The Critical Journey. The Critical Journey. Each of those stages have both the potential for someone to get stuck in uh, and not move on, and they've got a key factor which helps us move on to the next stage in our Christian development. And, and you can look at these and you can maybe plot yourself, but stage one is a recognition of God. That's right at the beginning. That's a sense of awe and a need for a Savior and greater meaning in life. We've all started there somewhere. Stage two, a life of discipleship where we are learning more about God. Meaning comes from belonging to a church and, and there's a sense of rightness and security in our faith. Stage three, the productive life. We're about doing things for God. And that's uniqueness in community, finding your giftings, finding your space to serve, and a sense of belonging in your church and being part of the body and, and taking up greater responsibility in this space. But the funny thing is, somewhere along these stages, they've got what is called the wall. And what the wall is, is it's that space we reach when things just aren't working anymore. And there's got to be more than just what we're experiencing in this space and the everyday same relationship with God. And some have described it this way. They say it's the mystery of our will meeting God's will face to face. It's when... The, the stuff we have, our understanding of who God is and our relationship with Him just doesn't answer the questions we have anymore. And if you can make it through the wall, uh, and that's part of stage four, it's an inward journey where we need to figure out a new way to do relationship with God and with others. And it's characterized by a life or faith crisis. Maybe you lose someone close to you or there's a tragedy or you go through something rough or your marriage is in trouble and it's not making sense anymore. And you've got to work through those things and do the internal work. Go see a psychologist. Go for a soul care. Um, you know, spend time at the feet of Jesus going, I need to figure out what does this actually look like? And, and then in stage five, it's the journey outward. It's learning to live out of a totally different place, a, a place where you're surrendered to God, a renewed sense of God's acceptance, a sense of deepening relationship, a sense of calling. And then in stage six, it's the life of love. And it's all about God. And it's living in obedience to God. Wisdom gained from life struggles. Compassionate living for others, not for self. And we've all met those people. They're in their 60s to 80s, a lot of them. And they just have such a peace about them where, where they've already done the work and they've journeyed with God. And now it's just incredible to be in their presence. And that's where I want to get to. But, but speaking about this framework, John Mark Comer says, most Christians never develop beyond stage three. And that is a scary thing for me because it's a very basic level of maturity. And there are lots of reasons for this. But one of them is one of the most pragmatic reasons is that we don't know how to get beyond stage three. We've never intentionally thought about how do I become more like Jesus because if I've got to live this way and I've got to do what is fitting in the Lord, then I need to know what is fitting in the Lord. And I've got to get to know how I am going to start looking more like Jesus. Because in stage three, the truth of it is we can do the things and it can still not let us be shaped and formed by Jesus. That's why there's a wall, because eventually we have to ask the question, is there more to this thing we call Christianity than simply reading my Bible and praying the Lord's Prayer and being in a community group and going to church? And the problem with living this externalized version of Christianity is that there will come a day when the storms come, and it's not going to be enough to answer the questions we have in that time. And I've been there. I've hit the wall. I did all of the external things, and still my life had sin in it. 
and I, it was riddled with sin, and eventually I had to stop and I had to ask myself, what am I doing? What am I missing? Because while Jesus was in my calendar, he was not in my heart. And there were whole parts of my life that were just off limits to him. So I'm going to ask, I'm going to read out a couple of scenarios right now. And I want to I ask you, if you had to give a rating from 1 to 10 of how surrendered that part of your life is to Jesus. Just, you know, you don't have to speak it out loud, please don't. But internally, just think about it. A rating from 1 to 10. What room have you given Jesus to move in your marriage? 1 to 10. In your parenting? 1 to 10. In your inner life, 1 to 10. In your relationships, 1 to 10. In your relationship with your parents, 1 to 10. In your workplace, 1 to 10. In your studies, 1 to 10. Because God desperately wants to come in. And he's at the door and he's saying, let me into your marriage, your work, into every space that you occupy because there should be no space that I don't take up residence in. You see, God's a gentleman and, and he's not going to enter where he's not invited. St. Augustine said it this way. He said, without God, we cannot. But without us, God will not. Revelations 3.20 puts it this way, and it says, See, I stand at the door and I knock, and if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him and eat with him and he with me. God does not want to come in and wreck our lives by entering those sensitive spaces. He wants to come in and eat with us and do life with us until every part of our life has his fingerprint on it. Proverbs 3, verse 5 to 6 says it this way. It says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lead not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. Let's be honest. As I'm speaking, who of us can recognize that in some ways we have relied on our own understanding and we want God to come in and make our paths straight? I said earlier that each of these spaces lends itself to dysfunction. And really, that dysfunction is often an indication of how much occupancy Christ has in those spaces in our lives. Because the spaces God does not occupy, the enemy will gladly fill. C.S. Lewis said it this way. He said, when you keep first things first, everything else follows. But when you make second things first, our intellect or the world's opinions first, you lose everything that follows. The second thing we need to do, and I'll draw us to a close, is to drop. And to drop to our knees. Now that we've recognized that there are spaces and places that we have not given God access to, we need to start following Him for real. Because in Matthew 7, verse 21 to 23, there's this passage where Jesus speaks about bearing good fruit in our lives and, and those that bear no fruit and and it says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. And on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name, drive out demons in your name, do many miracles in your name? And then I will announce to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawbreakers. If Jesus is forming us, and if we're doing what is fitting in the Lord, the fruit should be there. People will look at our lives and say, man, I want my marriage to look like theirs. I want my children to love Jesus the way theirs do. And, and how do they step into that difficult workplace every single day and still prosper? I want what they have. But as long as we live an empty Christianity, as long as we allow ourselves to get stuck at stage three, as long as Jesus isn't permeating all of who we are, that will never happen. So before we jump into the what to do quickly, we'll jump into the what this is not. 
We're not talking about willpower because if we're just talking about us doing the stuff, then we'll never get there. And, and we're not talking about more Bible study because I know we've all done that knee-jerk thing. We're like, my, my life is messed up. I need more of Jesus. So I'm going to read the whole New Testament in three days. You know, we've been there and uh, it's not just Bible. And for some of us, it's that zap from on high where we're like, Jesus, tonight I'm telling you my life is messed up. Tomorrow when I wake up, can I be a different person? And we hope that he just zaps us right, and, and tomorrow the world looks a little bit different. But it's not that. It wasn't that for the disciples, and it won't be that for us. Because really, when we look at the disciples, what changed their life? Time with Jesus, doing the things that he did, living in community with others, and listening to and responding to the Spirit. And it was those four things. So what do we need to do? We need time with Jesus. We need to do what he did. We need to live in vulnerable community. And we need to listen to what the Holy Spirit is telling us to do and go do that in each of those spaces. The first one is just spending time with Jesus. We need our minds renewed by time spent with Jesus. You can't. There's no shortcut. There's no, if I listen to the whole audiobook Bible quickly in, you know, one night, I will be able to just download Jesus. No, it's time. It's intentionality. And this is what takes you from stage three to stage four, five, and six, is the intentionality of figuring out how will I become more like Jesus by doing what the disciples did, by being with him more. And that might mean taking some things out to make room, to put some things in. I think in my life, I realized recently that Netflix and sometimes social media had a louder voice in my life than Jesus did. And I had to make certain decisions and say, I'm going to limit those two things so that there's more room in my life for this. And so that Jesus and his voice and his opinion over every area of my life speaks louder than these other things can do. That doesn't mean we don't watch Netflix or there's no social media in my life, but there had to become a different ratio and balance in those spaces. The second is to do what Jesus did. It's funny how we can read the word and we can hear what Jesus did, but we don't necessarily do the things he did. Did. And there's some practices that as we develop them in our lives will help form us and will help us stay connected to the Father. And these are things like Sabbath and prayer and fasting and solitude and scripture and community and generosity and serving and witness. And these are all taken from practicing the way and and if you want to know more about these things, you can go look them up on practicingtheway.org or simply read your scriptures and say, okay, Jesus fasted. What is it about fasting that can help me um, be closer to Jesus and become more like him? Jesus prayed fervently. How can I improve my prayer life? And the one thing I made the Hatfielders promise to do, and I want to make you promise to do it as well, is don't try and adopt all of this overnight. Pick one thing and say, for six months, I'm going to work on my prayer life and deepen it and, and see how I can journey further with God and do more of what I see Jesus doing. Pick one, one thing. The third, living in community. There is an aspect of living in community, allowing others under the hood of our lives and letting them speak into our lives that is non-negotiable in this Christian walk. I'm going to make a statement now. You can quote me on it. Solo Christians are some of the weirdest people I have ever met in my life. Okay. And uh, you can judge me for that. But the guys that say, I'm done with church, I'm living in the woods, and I'll be close to Jesus, there's an aspect of your discipleship that is going by the wayside and that you are losing. Because we are not always the best judges of what's going on in our life, in our marriage, in our parenting, and in our workplaces. Sometimes we need a brother or sister in Christ to come in and speak into those spaces of our life. When this thing that we are doing here goes wrong, it can go horribly wrong. But when it goes right, it is a glimpse of heaven. But like everything else in life, you get out what you get in, what you put in. And the fourth thing is listening and responding to the Holy Spirit. So Jesus sent us the Spirit to guide us, to reform us from the inside out, but most of all to help us live in the new life that we have been born into and to align into that. 
And I can't do it without the Spirit. I can't love my life, my wife well. I can't love our little girl well without the Spirit speaking into my life. And there have been times when the Spirit is telling me to do something, and I'm like, Spirit, no. Go away. I'm silencing you now. I want to do what I want to do. But when I have listened to the Spirit in obedience, He's done something just beautiful and beyond anything I could have fashioned or formed or thought of. He's leading me where I don't want to go sometimes, but I need the Spirit to daily download into my heart and my mind what Jesus requires of me and what is fitting in the Lord, in my workplace, in my marriage, in the way we parent our little girl. That's what I need. So I said there was a stop, a drop, and a roll. And what is the roll? You need to roll with it. There's an aspect of the Christian life that is just, yes, we're going to do these things, but hurdles are going to come. And the most important thing you can do is recognize that everything takes time. Christianity is a journey of long obedience in the same direction before you see the fruit. You're going to start to pray and everything's going to go crazy. Or you're going to start to fast and things are going to get a little bit harder. And all I want to encourage you with is simply roll with it. Trust the process. Trust Jesus as you roll with it. Amen? Amen. Amen. So I'm going to pray for us. And, uh, and the, the team are just going to put some music on as we pray. But I'm going to mention these spaces in our lives. And we're going to ask the Holy Spirit to just come do a bit of highlighting for us this morning. I hope uh, you guys are okay with that. But let's pray. Lord, we just thank you that you love us. We thank you that we don't need to do this life alone. We thank you that even as we start to feel uncomfortable, God, as I speak about these different spaces and places in our lives, that Holy Spirit, you are there already. And all we need to do is we simply need to take your hand and partner with your vision for that area of our lives, God, and do the things you are calling us to do. I'm going to mention eight spaces in our lives, and and really I want you to be so aware of the Spirit and where the Spirit just highlights, where He starts to move the minute I speak it. Just hold on to that space. Because maybe that's the space where the Spirit is is nudging you to give you to give more space to Jesus in that area. So the first is your inner life. Your inner life. The things you've been through, the traumas, the stuff you've packed away. The second is your workplace, your attitude towards work. Your marriage, parenting your relationship with your parents your studies your recreation what you do with your free time your friendships your finances. Jesus, we ask you this morning, would you come and take up more room in that space? And as a sign of surrender, can you just open your palms in front of you and just say, Jesus, I'm inviting you in this morning. Would you come into the spaces I've kept you out of or where I've started to just rely on my own intellect instead of reaching out to you and saying, God, show me what is fitting. You just invite him in and say, come and do whatever it is you want to do, Lord, in my mind, in my heart, in these spaces of my life. And I want to pray now for those of you that feel this space of my life is too far gone. My marriage is too much of a mess for there ever to be hope. Or my relationship to my children or my relationship to my parents is so messed up that I don't know how it can be redeemed. 
And Lord, I'm gonna pray that in those people that are sitting here this morning that feel that, or they feel, you know what? There's just no room for you to move in my workplace. God, would you come and move? Would you give us a sense of renewed hope for that space? And would you show us what you require of us? What do you need us to go do, Lord? How can we respond to what you are already doing in that space? Renew our hope and bring healing in those spaces, God. Let your kingdom come in those spaces. And I want to pray for those of you this morning who just as I was speaking, you just felt, I earnestly just want to become more like Jesus. I just want more of Jesus. I want to go further in the journey. I want to go deeper than I am now. And maybe you're finding yourself in the wall or you're finding yourself in a space where you feel stuck. God, would you come and unstick those of us that find ourselves in that space this morning? Would you show us how to go further and deeper, God? Would you give us time with you, God? Would you, would you help us to be intentional with the journey to go deeper and further with you? Spirit, for those people that are sitting here saying that this morning, can you just drop into their spirit now? What is one next step they can take? Would you come and show them this morning? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody. It's such a pleasure to be here. I'm going to